Uh, yeah, uh, hello everyone and uh, nice to see all of you here. And uh, my name is Tatiana Steinbuck and I'm a co-founder of a non-profit cultural organization Create Culture Group. And uh, we are a platform for professional development and networking for representatives of cultural and creative sectors. And I'm really happy to see all of you tonight for this uh, workshop. And this session is a part of our Create Culture Lab project. And uh, next week we are diving into the workshop called uh, Identifying Opportunities in the Creative Sector Strategies for Startups with Alex Kashkarov. And uh, the registration is already open. And now I'm handing over the mic uh, to Martina Smarozas, an urban planner and hey also yeah, a city development processes moderator and I'm sure he will, he will tell you about himself like everything and share his experience. So please feel free to ask questions after the session and uh, be active uh, and uh, yeah, enjoy this. Let's uh, take the most, the best from this workshop with Martinez. So this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. So, uh, as a quick introduction, maybe just to know the audience better. I'm just wondering where you're from, like uh, all of you. Maybe like this side. From Russia, then... Uh, okay, let's do it this way. Who's from Russia? One. Uh, Ukraine? Belarus? <laughs> okay. So, uh, majority is from Belarus, so kind of uh, neighbors. Um, uh, all neighbors, yeah. So, and I'm, uh, myself, I'm Martinas Marozas, I'm uh, like an uh, urban designer and planner. I, uh, uh, I studied and worked um, in the Netherlands for, for quite a while. And then somewhere around 13 years ago, I came back here. So, I kind of know, let's say, how some of you feel. Let's say, uh, what is to, let's say, start doing something uh, coming from some other context. Because um, at first, while moving to the Netherlands, you kind of have this kind of trauma, let's say, of immigration and uh, emigration, let's say, from your own country, kind of this cultural shock and so on. First you start to love the country, then you start to hate the country, then you start to love the country again, and so on. So this is like only natural processes. And then uh, I'm already like, um, once I came back, I, I thought that uh, like, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do exactly the same thing that I did in the Netherlands. However, there was no market like for that really. And then I thought, yeah, I'm just going to do it anyway. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, like urban planning in Lithuania, let's say 13 years ago, that was, was very different. So like public participation, the non-existent uh, category, like the planning is very much about zoning, kind of drawing colorful maps. And that's pretty much it. Um, then uh, there was also this kind of, um, uh, let's say, image of a specialist as a all-knowing, so no public consultations, yeah, which uh, in a sense was a little bit frustrating. And then you also see these kind of bad planning habit, hab habits when you talk about bicycle paths, the kind of a standard response is that uh, we're not Netherlands, nothing is going to happen here, nobody's going to use it. Well, they're all wrong. <laughs> So, uh, now I, I currently have a, a small urban design uh, practice in Vilnius, in uh, Taraso Shevchenko's uh, street. Uh, and uh, in total there's around like 10 of us, and then we cooperate a lot with, um, with uh, other architecture offices, with sociologists, with uh, uh, copywriters, various organ, like event organizers, uh, non-governmental organizations and so on that are kind of interested in urban transition, urban transformation, and so on. And then one, what, what do urban planners do? Well, we talk a lot about sustainability, 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 and this is kind of a classical, let's say, Venn diagram. Yeah, it's really about the environment, then about society and economy, and then if you kind of combine all of these, um, if you combine all of these uh, uh, fields, let's say, together, then your kind of solutions, if they are all covered, they're supposed to be sustainable. Uh, but that's a horribly academic, let's say, description of what we uh, are actually do. Usually, usually, like, the planning processes are much more, let's say, complicated, complicated 
and then uh, sometimes you you kind of feel that you're kind of revolving around the same thing. Uh, you start with the analysis, you kind of set the project objectives, then you go into kind of this development cycle that can turn around five, six, seven, or maybe hundreds of times. And then you maybe have a, uh, a definition of a long-term strategy or something like that. Maybe then the politicians change, then you cancel the long-term strategy, and then you start with analysis, set project objectives, and so on. So if anyone would give me, let's say, a euro or a dollar for every time the project had to restart, maybe I, I would kind of have retired early, let's say. So like urban design planning is, is really about change. And then what I wrote, uh, let's say, in the, in the invitation is that if uh, what one advice um, uh, that I could um, uh, tell an aspiring urban planner or let's say practitioner, I would say like learn how to kill your babies, like how to kill your ideas, the best ones, unfortunately, and learn how to embrace the worst ones <laughs> that you had. Because sometimes like in these development cycles, not everything that is good survives and not everything that is, that is bad kind of is, is, um, uh, is, is um, forgotten. And sometimes like it's not really up to you in most cases. And then uh, uh, it really depends on the strength of your mandate. Yeah, but if you're not an elected politician in this kind of fortunately democratic society, then usually like you have to deal with people. Yeah. Usually, like once we're talking about urban development process, we're kind of always saying that it's really about three things. You basically need land, yeah? You need uh, a little bit of money, and then you need the ideas, what to do with it. This is kind of oversimpli oversimplified, the very simplistic uh, like, uh, uh, explanation of why would you need an urban design. Uh, once you have these three components, once you say, I have a plot, I, have, I want to build a house, which is, let's say, an idea. I want to build a hotel. I want to build whatever. And I have a budget for it. Then you don't need an urban designer. Yeah? You need an architect. Go to an architect. Hire one. Yeah? We usually say that um, uh, we're only interested in the projects that uh, miss at least one component. Yeah? So once we're talking about that, most of the, uh, let's say, developers or some uh, stakeholders have land, or some of them have money, but they have no idea what to do with it. Some of them have ideas, but they don't have land or money. And that's, the, that's, that's where our profession revol uh, revolves around. And then once we have, let's say, land and money, then we can talk about profit. Once we have money and, and ideas, we can f talk about partnerships. And then once we have land or ideas for the land is the design. Yeah, so it's usually, I mean, in, in uh, I think in, in uh, it's in 11 years since I started in my office. I think I showed it like if someone would give me a dollar, <laughs> I would retire <laughs> again. Then uh, once, um, and then I also was I kind of uh, discovered there's this uh, one uh, the architect in the graph. He was uh, like a, one of a uh, ammo division from, from OMA, which is Office for Metropolitan Architecture, one, well, architecture, one of the kind of very well known uh, offices and then I kind of started reading this book then I, I, I read that one then I read this one and I just yesterday finished that one and it's it's sort of like architectural novels but but uh, I was kind of like uh, inspired about that it's not only it, it the, those kind of things that uh, happen uh, do not really happen to me only they happen kind of to everybody yeah, and then somehow uh, I thought of maybe uh, maybe it's a um, it's a good time, let's say, to learn and kind of reflect from failures of of, of or some kind of a, uh, miscalculations that let's say I did in the last ten years, because like uh, everyone could brag, let's say, about the successes, but they're not really uh, that important. I mean, it's difficult to achieve something and then to do something good, but then uh, the failures that they kind of teach you the best. I think. So, uh, and I thought that I'm going to present like three projects that are, then one is about Neresru regeneration, which uh, was started like 10 years ago. Then there was a really short, like a concept about Klaipeda Eco Harbor, like a concept where, where we were, our office was hired by like local community to kind of do like this very crazy thing. And then the streets of Noyamis, this, I mean, uh, who of you are in Vilnius for more than, let's say, five years? 
Okay, so what you, you obviously have an opinion about the streets, and then you also maybe follow the debate about this kind of widening. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, like, uh, I also have an opinion once uh, uh, one of my employees slipped. He's actually from Belarus and kind of dislocated his uh, uh, elbow. So, yeah, uh, uh, let's say I have some comments to the current municipality. <laughs> and there would not be very nice. However, uh, well, you know, you never bite a, a, a feeding hand. <laughs> So uh, let's start with the River regeneration. I was like super naive 10 years ago. I was like coming, at, uh, coming from the Netherlands and then we all this kind of participation process and then there's uh, enormous amount of uh, money. So you basically figure out something, you kind of pitch it, then some kind of politicians say, hey, that's cool, that uh, you pitch it in Rotterdam. And then the, the main thing is that the Amsterdam would not uh, come up with that first, and you kind of hide it and they kind of implement it. And then there's this uh, a culture of uh, being first, being like the most innovative in the world. And then uh, it's, it's fun. Yeah, planning there is fun, but then 10 years ago, it was not fun yet. So, and then the former mayor, uh, Remigius Shumashis, uh, uh, we, we had a talk and then and one of these, uh, um, one of these uh, um, advisors asked, okay, what, what would you do? How would you kind of create a regeneration, like river regeneration project, which is like so huge? And uh, how would you kind of make sure that there's nobody left out, let's say from parties? And then we, at the time we were doing this kind of like process proposals and then they're just like really simple steps. So we first launched the, launch the, the, the program, we do the analysis, then we have some kind of a, maybe some Facebook questionnaires. Then we try to formulate an ambition, what we actually want. Then we kind of slice it layer by layer. We create an ambition and then we kind of continue and then we go into project implementation. At that time it was it kind of, seemed uh, uh, very uh, clear and of course there was this kind of holy grail of uh, participation that kind of should guide you let's say from uh, one um, uh, part let's say of this cliff and then some people tried and then they were not very lucky and then uh, I was kind of thinking that yeah maybe let's 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 uh, um, uh, participation will be something that will kind of uh, make the project uh, go on its own almost so yeah, so we started with this process plan, which was kind of uh, both abstract and detailed at the same time. So, but it's always very good to visualize what, what, what is the product that you anticipate, let's say. So whether it's some kind of a structural framework, whether it's a document, whether it's a booklet, whether it's a conversation, yeah. All of the things that you kind of do, like for me, it, it helps a lot if I just kind of visualize. So for instance, like if I, I'm saying that I'm just going to have development scenarios and it's going to be on a website, then for me, it's like very easy to also measure of what, what uh, the, the KPIs and then uh, everything. Uh, then we started with the structural vision. And then, and then the structural vision is just like an abstract term. It's not really a planning document, but it actually helps to um, uh, figure out this kind of modus operandi or... or or the, uh, the code of how do you deal with certain areas in the city. And then we say, that, okay, so like along the Constitution Avenue with this kind of sports field, there's like very, very uh, like a diverse environment. There's also a lot of changes. Then there's also a lot of uh, like dynamic. Everyone is building something. There's people moving around. So maybe you could just do something crazy there, yeah? Maybe you could do something with sports. You kind of build some bridge like skate park and whatever, yeah? For instance, Jverinas, yeah, if you know Vilnius well, it's already kind of calm, like residential neighborhood. People are happy there. So maybe you don't really want to kind of like get your like hair loose and then do some crazy things with, with bungee jumping like from bridges and so on. That, that would be a little bit too much. Then you also have like a lot of natural like landscapes along Antakalnis and so on. And people do enjoy it. They kind of go fishing. They, they, there's some like beavers hiding in the, in the bushes, uh, whatever. So, and then we kind of try to, to create these really small, let's say icons just to, just to say, okay, like maybe it's a good idea to just pitch this idea. Maybe it's a good idea to pitch this idea. And then we kind of like uh, develop the main questions. Okay, so what should be the, the, the project goals? What is the program? I mean, what is the program of the river? 
what what like cafe <laughs> like floating cafe floating in a hotel yeah like uh, is is it uh, but then you're kind of thinking okay maybe let's let's then talk about the ecosystem maybe let's talk about the 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 some kind of extra infrastructure maybe let's talk about kind of uh, some uh, sailing and then we're like boating around uh, then what are the priorities yeah and then, uh, like in urban planning, I think one th one thing is is uh, that is the most difficult is actually to uh, agree upon the priority. So that in this particular location, the priority is nature, yeah. While in this particular location, the priority, for instance, is um, sports. So and then dividing the priorities and kind of organizing them in various spatial conditions is is is, is quite well both challenging, but it's essential in order to make the project work. So what we did, we have this kind of, we, we, we said that, okay, we're gonna invite everybody, 100 meters left and right uh, next to the river. We send out invitations. It's all like public developers, uh, 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 crazy local activists, uh, like some cat ladies or whatever, everybody, yeah? So everyone is invited. Then we kind of, uh, divide the river like a sausage and then we say that okay so this part that's the like the activist should supposed to talk about this then there's uh, like Jverina's activist then we say that you have discussed that the ones we're talking about um, for instance uh, close to this uh, cultural and sports palace Porto Rume then there's also a little bit different set of activists so we kind of divide them and then we say that okay so like, you choose your goals and then you pitch it to them and then uh, you continue. Then we also had this kind of uh, uh, like division and then there's this um, uh, they collect this kind of Olympic committee with the terrace. And then there's this, uh, it was super unorganized sports fields in the front of um, a wide bridge. Then there's also a lawn. And then uh, we also had like idea cards. So basically, yeah. So just, just to help people, just because most of the people are not really creative. You know, so like you cannot tell an accountant like um, after he spent like 25 years in accounting that come to the workshop, I'll give you some markers and now create something amazing. <laughs> That's just naive, you know, so you, you need to provide tools for people to be creative. And then what, what we did, we say, OK, so let, let's let's create some kind of functional cards just like for various things. And then let's let's make people talk. Then there's also a very important thing is, is money. We knew that EU had a budget of around like 25 million. So we printed 25 million euros <laughs> in a printer. Of course, we also designed, it was it was obviously fake money. So, uh, and then like once you try printing like in existing uh, uh, like denominations of like maximum to 500, then we, then we realized that 25 million is actually a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it would not fit in the room. So we, we kind of had the denomination of 50,000, 100,000 and so on. So that it's just much easier and it occupies uh, much less space. So, and um, we organized this massive workshop with around like 150 people. So uh, first phase, we uh, make them discuss about the specific uh, part uh, of site. And then they have the, we divide uh, we took half of money, half of this 25 million, like fake money, which was like connected to the real money. Uh, and then we gave it out according to the size of the area. Yeah, so for instance, like one hectare gets 1 million, like 25 hectares would get like 25 more than, than that. So, however, there was still like half of money missing. And then first they kind of, uh, people had an idea and they say, okay, so we really want some kind of a sports field. We also want uh, this, um, maybe some kind of a, a hotel, let's say, or a floating hotel or whatever. And everyone pitched an idea. And then uh, some, um, some, some people said that, okay, we really want to do this thing, but we don't really have enough money. And then everyone thought that the workshop is over, but then there was a second phase where we actually like divided 12 and a half million euros and like divided them equally. And then the condition was that you can invest but not on, but not in your own project, and this is where the market happened. And then it was, it was actually crazy. And then people were saying, "Okay, I will give you some money, but only if you put this function, <laughs> this particular site." So uh, eventually, we had this workshop report, and we took the money back. Then we figured out that the where the biggest investment should be, and then 
this fake money actually turned into a very real uh, investment. Yeah. Uh, so with all these kind of things, and then that, that was kind of the end result, like people would stick and then would kind of bargain, try to buy some functions, and then uh, we would end up like three months later uh, doing first, uh, let's say, master plans. Uh, then uh, we also, uh, that was Neres River uh, 10 years ago. So it was kind of the embankment was crumbling, uh, crumbling and falling apart. And uh, first uh, with a little bit of uh, kind of Get digging everything out, then a little bit of concrete, and then phase one. Just because construction or like this um, design process takes so long, but we wanted to just repair things. Maybe not like reconstruct it completely, just, just so that people start using it. And uh, without even a project being implemented or started, we, 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 we started doing these kind of initiatives and events so that, so for instance, there's this uh, September, beginning of September, there's this Capital Days, Sosnes Dianos. Then there are some kind of, uh, maybe we want to put a marathon and then some like uh, races or, 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 or on the river and then so on. So some of them happened, but uh, because we needed two years of testing uh, various functions. So this is how this uh, then uh, cafe appeared, which is still there now. Some people kind of like it. Uh, it's a little bit trashy, but then at that time did, we didn't care because of that was... Uh, like a million times more action than uh, a year before. Then there are also some uh, like uh, 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 racing event, events on water. And then we started like already designing this uh, uh, sports area, which collected the most of the, this fake money uh, in, the, in, in the process. And um, we said that, uh, yeah, maybe let's take the existing function, the big function. So there was a very trashy skate park of 1,000 square meters. Then we do an excellent skate park of at least 2,000 square meters. There was free, there were free uh, uh, beach volleyball fields. We double it and then we make it like uh, so that we can have international competitions. Then we have some kind of uh, like um, um, like exercise machines for elderly, like free. Then we do uh, like a body bodybuilding like uh, uh, area. And then we also uh, say that, okay, so, and then we also have two uh, of these areas that are meant for various initiatives or things that we're not able to, f to figure out at this time. Just because we're not, let's say, smart enough to see in the future, maybe we, there will be some extra sports. And then so we create some maybe infills for future programs. Yeah? And then the construction started. And then once the construction starts, it kind of, it's, it's a completely different story. So everyone is pissed. Like, why did you destroy like the perfect skate park? Why did you destroy the, the beach volleyball? And then the media also goes crazy. And then like the soil starts moving. And why are you kind of destroying the embankment? I mean, the Vilnius will be just uh, uh, like, will flood or whatever. And then there are some like, every time a construction starts, like you have to anticipate in the story. And then, okay, so we, we kind of show the design. I mean, the communication is, is always a flaw because municipality is lagging and then everyone has an opinion. Everyone is commenting on Facebook and usually it just, it's, it's always not there. Then there's like, once the construction starts and once people start, start seeing the first results, it's a little bit calmer. And then once it's, um, uh, once it's finished, usually, uh, people are more or less uh, happy with the things that happen. But it's just like the process is very tough because um, uh, it really takes a toll on you to like build something. <laughs> because uh, at first you really think that, um, you really think that uh, it's, um, it's not good enough. Or like you're always a little bit uh, scared if, if it will turn out, let's say, the way it was in the rendering and so on. And then there's also like a design which is very like clean and then uh, you have that, <laughs> like during construction. Yeah, and then you have like that at the end of a construction. And currently it kind of works uh, more or less uh, fine. Ah, uh, yeah, so some PowerPoint effects that I did not know that I would put. So, key takeaways. So for me, I think that making planning, planning simpler and more engaging is, 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 is a good, always a good thing. And it kind of proved that, uh, that um, uh, it was kind of a success and a very easy way to quickly formulate the development program. 
Then we have uh, like always to be strategic so that do not overinvest in certain areas that uh, don't want it. And then you have to kind of divert the money in the areas that are like much more open for the investment. Then we have to in the, in identify responsibilities and set performance indicators, boring, building the discipline dreams, boring. Then deal with the legal dimension early. We had like uh, a lot of boring discussion with the people who financed the project, the way we divided it, the way we finance infrastructure, the way we finance like bicycle paths, because everyone was, everything was subdivided and there are like these kind of multiple sources of, let's say, EU financing, which makes it incredibly difficult to e eventually like build it because you have to like divide which part, let's say, of this asphalt belongs to bicycle path, which part of that belongs to sports infrastructure. So it, it was absolutely crazy. And then I really like think that dealing with that early would, would save us enormous amount of time. Obtain early support, increase likelihood of positive impact, and then phase implementation in terms of space and resources. One thing that usually people forget is that we're not only limited with financial resources, we're also limited with human resources. In, in like 99% of cases. And some municipalities might be able to uh, plan like the most amazing like a portfolio of, of spectacular projects and then might, they might also get the finances. But actually delivering the project and actually going to the end is extremely difficult. Yeah? And then uh, it is better to do it smaller, like maybe if, if let's say one person can handle let's say five projects in five years, uh, then it's it's not it's not really clever to make people handle 15 projects in in the same amount of time you need free, uh, more people and always communicate what is about to happen because like yeah with the construction you say that now the bulldozers will come and i will destroy everything but then like it's going to be good trust me <laughs> i'm an architect <laughs> yeah then there was also like the second uh, kind of uh, project which I learned a lot from a, a lot about politics and a lot about how like p politics on a national level about a little bit about lobbyism and so on and it was a clip at the eco harbor and at, at that time there was a lot of discussion about the um, uh, offshore harbor uh, which is like uh, goes into sea in Klaipeda and then there was a lot of discussions uh, in Klaipeda about the pollution, noise, some kind of particles, the, the fertilizer from Belarus kind of spilling into uh, like water, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, then, uh, and then we have like, um, we have some positive things, you know, so it says like uh, Klaipeda Harbor is like the, the lungs of a, a national economy. Clip of the harbor is is um, is like a bridge uh, uh, from Asia to Scandinavia, and then most you you can read right. I'm just uh, sorry for that. So like there is a lot of positive things, yeah. However, there is also a lot of negative things that are happening. So for instance, they're saying like like. Um, uh, living next to Klaipeda of the harbor is like a never ending noise and then uh, crumbling uh, walls of your apartments and then uh, and then there's also uh, the traffic uh, and then the tourists that they don't want to stay in Klaipeda and so on so uh, there's like let's say there's never like there are never objective headlines there's always either like over to overly negative or overly positive. So that's a little bit frustrating, but I guess in this kind of clickbait um, uh, times, it's, that's the only way uh, how it works. So some people say that like Klaipeda is harbor, but then we're saying that, well, no, not really. I mean, there's just too much tension and there's just too much uh, friction happening. I mean, Klaipeda is a beautiful like uh, 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 town. However, this, um, uh, harbor is something that, that we need to develop a little bit better relationship. So we did a lot of case studies. Uh, like in two weeks, we just uh, read the almost nonstop and then tried to figure out, this is just one example about Rotterdam and then their kind of slogans, then how do they deal with the municipality, what is the freight, then they also have this mass flakta, which is um, like the uh, harbor that is built on a reclaimed land in the sea, in the North Sea. 
And this is uh, the size comparison. So this is Clifford Harbor and this is Rotterdam. <laughs> So just just to, just to like uh, figure out what what the actual scale is. So it's uh, more than like twelve times. Um, the difference is more than than uh, twelve times. Then uh, we see trends that uh, there's more freight traffic. So increasing three four percent uh, during COVID uh, uh, stopped now uh, going up. We also kind of um, uh, uh, sketch all the ships. And then it's it's very easy to to because like if you if you turn it then you you have it a graph of of ship sizes, and uh, in, at least in two thousand uh, two thousand eighteen it was around this um, uh, uh, that was the biggest ship and then you already have you already have like even even bigger ones, then you have uh, more passengers also people trying uh, traveling on the cruise ships uh, also traveling between uh, um, Lithuania Scandinavia and so on. With cars, without cars, we also have a lot of uh, Lithuanian families living in Sweden, Norway. So that that's really important, let's say, uh, uh, connection for our uh, diaspora. Yeah? Chinese influence, like everywhere, with this kind of Belt and Road Initiative. So um, uh, we know that. And then uh, once we talk about uh, global trends, then we see that most of harbors are kind of slowly moving out into the uh, open sea. Ecology is important. Circular economy, active cooperation with the city, increasing numbers of cruise ships like tourist experience, services, and uh, so on. And then uh, we also checked, okay, so what, is, what are the current plans? And then they, uh, they have this kind of visualization of, the, of uh, around 130 hectares of this uh, in-sea uh, development. And then um, the Kalepada uh, community was very concerned because, uh, because of a coastal erosion. And there is a phenomenon where, for instance, if you build a pier one kilometer into the uh, into the sea, usually it erodes around more than ten kilometers of coastline. And um, especially, it's, it's it's valid for the sandy beaches because most of the uh, most of the sand we get from Kaliningrad, which just flows, and then during storms. It erodes a little bit, but then with water, it kind of ends up in Palanga and uh, so on. And then if we build a pier, then the coastal, then during storms, the coast erodes, but it, the, the, the sand doesn't really come back. And then we see that if you, if you actually build the train line and there's no gap, then this kind of coastal erosion would end up uh, after Palanga. So it means that this entire coastline from Klaipeda to Palanga will most likely disappear. And that was, that was kind of a very valid point. And then all the engineers uh, kind of at the time said that your um, concerns are not really grounded. However, like the clip at the university had, let's say, some other opinions. And they asked, okay, so can we, can we figure out like real quick some kind of a proposal of, or counter proposal of how can we do it differently? And at that time I was very naive and then said, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm gonna do it. And then objective was to propose an environmentally and ecologically sustainable alternative for the development of the outer harbor which we contribute to the growth of the, uh, of the quality of life of the city of uh, Klaipet. Yeah? And harbor, quality of life, yeah, it doesn't, re doesn't really work. So we thought, okay, so is there a place in these kind of 99 kilometers of, like we only have 99 kilometers of uh, uh, coastline, which is 99 kilometers more than Belarus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're fine. <laughs> So is there a place in the 99 kilometers of Lithuanian seaside or coastline where the development of a port of Klaipeda would create the least conflict? Yeah? And then we have this uh, Koronian uh, spit up to Kaliningrad, all protected national park reserve, not possible to do anything there. Uh, you, want to, you, want to, you want to, I don't know, like um, uh, build some kind of a wooden uh, tree house, sorry, not possible. They even, they even deported the last cow from this uh, reserve. Like, like some years ago, and it was kind of, uh, because it was not meant for agriculture, recreation only, reserve, which, well, you have to be like, uh, so this is our jewel, and then I, I love it as well, so. Uh, that would also be easily accessible by train, so this is like the train line, and then we say that, okay, 500, 500 meters from the train line, that, that, that's a good distance. 
and freight transport. So we also need the highway, some kind of infrastructure. And it's not small roads, but kind of normal roads, like A1, A2, A6, uh, some highway. So that would then, uh, and it should also be not in a protected area. And then we see that, okay, so uh, this one, this one is out just because this is a protected forest. Uh, and not closer than 500 meters from uh, a resident. Yeah, so we also draw a, bu draw a buffer. And then the sea has to be deeper than 15 meters. Yeah, and then, like it looked a little bit gloomy. And then we look, oh wow, look at this spot. There is, let's say, a, a spot that is not protected. There is no people living there. And maybe we kind of squeeze in something there. Uh, and then we say, okay, so there's Gurulu Mishkas. There's already a train line that actually goes there. And then that's the area of the least conflict because, like, we overlay it, everything, and then that's that's only 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 like the the the, the forest, but it's not protected. It's there. So we say, okay, so let's 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 see what 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 are the plans for the city. So they have like a plan 130 uh, hectares in the sea, and 200 hectares. Ah, it moved a little bit uh, in a, a Coronian uh, lagoon uh, for containers and then so on and. Uh, uh, like a little bit further, this is where they dump all the kind of uh, sand that they dig out from a clip of the harbor for the larger uh, things. And then we say, okay, so this is like this is the shape of their uh, uh, harbor, and we say that maybe let's move it here. Yeah, this is very like oversimplified, and this is just about the thinking process of, of, of uh, like not as an expert. Uh, then we have this, let's say, shape. Uh, let's put it here. Yeah. Let's add 10%. And then we have this very, let's say, technocratic uh, shape. And then we say that, uh, then we have an argument that, okay, so if this shape works and this shape works, we uh, combine them, they should work. I mean, I'm not, an ex not a harbor expert and I was not paid and it was like almost pro bono work for the community. So let's see. And then we also put it uh, below the 15 meter uh, line. Then we say that, okay, so like large ships, they have more than 20 meters. And then we could also have uh, uh, some kind of a harbor for, um, for recreational ships, for yachts and then so on. Uh, then 500 meters from the closest inhabitant, we have existing train line. Maybe we could just somehow connect also with the containers. Maybe we could have either a tunnel or a bridge. Once uh, we, we did a case study of how much that would cost and the price is comparable. So like a, a kilometer bridge or a kilometer tunnel, I mean, it doesn't really make any difference. It's, it's still a lot of money, like a, like a billion euros and so on. So yeah, what the hell? You could also have some kind of artificial island in between and then uh, so on. Then we say, okay, so the transport, the, the, the bridge or tunnels is going to be used both for trains and then both for, uh, for cars or, or, or trucks. Then we, uh, like in order to soften it a little bit, then we create some kind of artificial arch archipelago exactly in the spot where currently they dump all the, all the soil uh, that, is, that is dug out out of a, a canal out of port canal and then they, this is their uh, this is where they dump it so we say I keep keep on doing that yeah and then maybe like in the in the, in the, in many years once you kind of dump it in the same spot then you're going to have uh, when a natural ecosystem will appear then we say okay let's do some functional zoning and then we could have some like to the sea we could have this work side and then facing the city we could have a little bit of recreational side like with maybe some large dunes and um, then once we have a phase one, then we can have like one of the biggest container terminals like in a, in a Baltic Sea. And then with the artificial archipelago and dunes with uh, some kind of maybe recreational facilities already in this uh, artificial island. island. And then uh, also a space where it's planned right now for offshore wind uh, in, in the open sea. And then we also have a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, inland spaces for logistics to stop so that, so that it's not, uh, 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 so that it works. Because like uh, Rotterdam works exactly the same. They have like a area for trucks to stop, then they get a number and then they kind of drive to harbor so that like it works like a clockwork. And then we have this kind of concept uh, of the eco harbor in the uh, uh, open sea. And that was our proposal and we say that like once you have this kind of dunes with some cranes sticking out, 
then Claypeda could actually like become uh, a, a real uh, like Claypeda could be synonymous with the harbor. And then on one side, you could have some kind of almost uh, like natural landscape with some like uh, human made uh, thing sticking out uh, to the top. And this is from the Solando Capura, the view from Solando Capura, which is a kind of famous uh, tourist destination. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we presented this idea. Uh, and then of course, <laughs> people say that, yeah, like, thanks a lot, but no thanks. <laughs> Then there's also like an image of uh, this uh, former like uh, party member and said that it's his idea, uh, not the community. Then uh, there's also uh, like a lot of critique uh, for that. But then, yeah, essentially we had this kind of just giant meeting with a lot of politicians. And you see that once the text is almost the same in everything, you think, oh, God damn it. I mean, I was, I was so naive. I mean, the, the, these kind of all things where it came out uh, like a, an hour after our presentation and you kind of think, oh, Jesus, I mean, that's, that's like, you, 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 you cannot really, you cannot really uh, fight with big business, you know, you cannot fight with like 10% of Lithuanian GDP in one room. Yeah. Oh, well, so it, that's, that's one of the things like in, in my presentation where I say that things that should happen but don't. So that's, that's one of the things. And I, I kind of still believe that like this artificial island, that's the only way, how can we kind of battle this coastal erosion, preserve, let's say, the beaches, have ec ecosystemic value, deal with uh, noise pollution and have um, like, um, uh, uh, have like a best of two worlds. I mean, and in this kind of complicated task, it was a, for myself, it was a very, uh, very good exercise, yeah? In the, as, 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 a, as a process of thinking. First, you kind of investigate, you figure out something new, and then you design something, and then you present something, then nothing happens. <laughs> what the hell? Okay, so the key takeaways are that um, we have to, like, we should inform media early about the things that uh, we're about to present in order to control the narrative. Because if you don't control the narrative, then yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, someone else does uh, make technical things more technical. So, and then our like key thing was uh, that uh, let's say out of all the technical things that we should have done, we just didn't have more, more, a lot of time to do that. And money, of course, engage local communities and politicians. So the community was engaged. However, local politicians, it, it, it was a surprise. Be aware that larger businesses are not very flexible. Uh, make sure you, that you have the right people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Always. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But this this was this was a project where I actually learned a lot about about uh, uh, about that. Uh, uh, you are not really like how to feel not in control and uh, how to feel that um, um, even though you like you you died you you did your best. However, it's not very much appreciated, and it's fine. You know, in ten, I, at first I was kind of very uh, disappointed, but then uh, once looking after 10 years, I actually gained, gained uh, much more from it than, than, than I lost. Then let's talk about the calm streets of uh, No Yamas, which is also kind of very controversial project. Uh, and then um, it's also, uh, we thought, okay, no, no, no. We, we already learned from our mistakes. So let's start with communication. Let's start with uh, with kind of uh, let's uh, with the control of the narrative. Let's also like engage the community. Let's also make everyone know what is happening. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, like a local history of No Yamestis. So the, from this uh, kind of Pohulanka, uh, then there's this uh, the German time, the Polish, and then the current situation, and then all the plans. So there's a lot of amazing things happening that we want to preserve, highlight, and then so on. We also did an analysis of transport flows. It's just some of the maps with like all the functions, how people walk, like walk through every street and then highlighted every curb, uh, highlighted every problem. So like, so from uh, like uh, dangerous, like in parking, then uh, poor vegetation and, and so on. So kind of mapped all the problems in the, in the, in the city. And then what we realized is that, um, okay, what, what, what it's all about, this kind of calm street. So our streets are too wide and our cars are too fast, making the environment less safe and less livable. That was kind of a starting point. If cars drive too fast, then it means that it's less, less safe for people who want to cross road. Duh. 
And then actually the winter shows of how much asphalt we really need. And then once you think, okay, so like if this can stay for two weeks, let's say, <laughs> so maybe that's the only thing that we actually need. And then once you check the, the current regulations and you see that like uh, all of our streets have too much asphalt and it's, 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 um, uh, and it's a kind of common trend in all the post-Soviet uh, Europe. And then we say, okay, so what are the calm streets? And we say, yeah, we took uh, Vitania Street just because it's very close to our office. And then we say, okay, that's uh, 30 meters. So there's this uh, kind of Khrushchevka and then there's this um, Shashatuke, which is, was a military factory some time ago, a long time ago, and it's like the di distance between facade is 30 meters, and then one of the like uh, uh, nicest streets that uh, uh, that I kind of liked in Amsterdam once I was living there and I was kind of cycling it uh, through it almost uh, every day, it's also 30 meters, and I was kind of surprised. God damn it! I mean, how can you fit so much, so much things in this uh, tiny piece of of, of uh, land? Is in this kind of strip in, in between the facade? And you see, okay, so you have bicycle parking, you have direct entrances, you have some kind of green space, you have parking, you have like micro park for dog walking and so on. And then you kind of think, okay, and what do we have? Yeah, well, we have asphalt. Cool. <laughs> Um, then uh, we, we say that no, the calm streets are spaces for living, working and leisure, not just for li like a transit from uh, A to B. So the, the street is something that starts from one facade and ends on the other facade. Cars is part of it and it should not occupy more than 30%. So like 30% we give it to nature, 30% we give it to cars, and then 30% we give it to, um, to pedestrians. Fair enough, right? Especially if we're talking about uh, uh, streets and then we want some kind of commercial activity along the perimeters and facades and so on. And then we have this kind of like varying approaches. So some good old towns, you see that you have this kind of urban approach where design informs people about how they should use public space. And then you have this kind of traffic engineer approach where you need like millions of signs, we need sidewalks, you need some kind of uh, barriers and then uh, like uh, whatever. No? So we say that maybe, maybe a design actually could be a way of how we can inform about the people of how to, they should use the streets. And then we kind of say, okay, so what do we need? We, we need lively paths, we need lots of green and then some kind of multimodal balance, you know? So like where to park a bike and uh, so on. And then we prioritize the pedestrians and cyclists and then uh, we go for cars. And the, yeah, our aims are basically to shape um, um, the, the, the aim of this project, which is like a concept, just to uh, uh, show how small changes in the street profile can actually uh, bring a lot of like positive impact. You know? And then we said that, uh, okay, so what if we just create everything in between the existing curbs and then we just use as much, uh, we use as much asphalt as it is necessary according to the, like these traffic regulations. And then this is the Vitania and Shevchenko Street. And then we say that, uh, okay, like, why don't we do it like this way? Uh, then we have also uh, a little bit uh, narrow streets with some kind of uh, infills uh, for uh, some greenery, wider pedestrian paths. Then we have uh, this um, uh, like uh, space for trees to uncover roots so that they get more air, they get more, they get more uh, greenery. And then uh, so that there's a space for nature uh, bees, whatever. Then we also create some like spaces for for uh, local businesses so that they could, let's say, thrive and maybe people could in not only enjoy just walking, let's say, along the street, but they would just use it as a public space. Yeah. So, and then we have like these kind of quite detailed, let's say, conceptual proposals for, let's say, almost every street in Noyamist. This was some kind of a street profile. However, we did not, let's say, anticipate that it, uh, uh, like you, you should not build it, you should like, still have the project. And then uh, what happened is that uh, some people, let's say, decided that, um, you know what? I think that your visualizations are good enough. Let's build it. <laughs> and then that was, uh, that was a bit uh, uh, surprising uh, because obviously like design needs some time and it needs multiple revisions. And then there was a kind of uh, the political term uh, was uh, beginning, uh, 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 was at the end and then there was some kind of a rush and then 
the 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 bulldozers came and then there was some renovation uh, of uh, underground heat uh, uh, infrastructure heating infrastructure said okay let's do it so let's restore it already in a new way people will not notice it <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so what eventually uh, we uh, got uh, we got that this the streets became the major topic in uh, the mayor's election campaign <laughs> So one way, it is uh, funny that uh, this kind of subject is, is, is uh, became so uh, kind of polarizing. On the other way, uh, you also see that uh, there's a lot of, let's say, opposition if you, uh, if you skip some steps. And in one way, our job as an urban planner is usually to provide a vision. However, the architects usually have to detail it and then put it in drawings. But once you kind of uh, uh, go into shortcuts, then yeah, bad things happen, you know, because you, you really need to design it well in order to implement it well. So my conclusion is sometimes too much innovation is a little bit too much. So you always have to kind of, uh, let's say, count your blessings and then always uh, try, to, um, uh, try to maybe, let's say, limit yourself a little bit and then also like have the right... Um, uh, right people in the room, not only the, the yes men or, or yes women who actually want to do it. Then uh, you have to anticipate that everyone has an opinion, which is uh, your idea. <laughs> then uh, uh, participation does not end after the analysis phase. And then once we do analysis, we do the kind of questionnaire, we ask people, so, okay, so do what you want, what's your opinion, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the participation process has to continue. And then that's, that's, that's one thing that I learned. And then you basically have to have a communication plan all the way through, uh, through, the, uh, through, this, uh, through the project implementation. Then communicate early and uh, uh, communicate clearly and efficiently because there's like once people start having an opinion, then you have this like multiple narratives for communication. So everyone's kind of talking, but everybody's missing a point. Every, then the firemen say that, uh, that the fire brigade would not pass, but then you kind of ask them, okay, so which law do you want to change? I mean, because we're designing according to law. So you say the streets are too narrow, so that, like, it's in the law. And then, and then uh, once, you, once you kind of start uh, like discussing clearly, then, then you also realize that, ah, God damn it, communication again, you know? So then, uh, uh, and then there's a lot of moving parties, uh, so then, uh, uh, basically, your, uh, one way to, in, to implement a project is actually to control the narrative to, to the end. Um, and that's, I think, the main thing that uh, I learned is, let's say, let's not create opportunities for easy political gain. Yeah. So, like, if politicians see that there's some kind of a easy horse uh, to jump on, then they, like, the streets, ah, the, 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 the immigrants, ah, oh, the, the minorities, then the whatever. So they usually like jump for opportunity. And if you create an opportunity to do that, then usually what happens is that they, they will definitely use it. Do not do shortcuts. Some projects have to take a long time because they must go through, uh, through uh, many revisions. Uh, making shortcuts for some kind of a conceptual phase is, uh, is a good exercise. However, once you're talking about actually like building a city, I think it's good time. It's, 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 it's a good idea to have a lot of critique. It's a good idea to have a, a lot of discussion. And it's a good, it's a good idea to have a lot of, let's say, uh, democracy in, in, a, in a city plan. That's it. Thank you very much. So, questions? I have several. <laughs> Go ahead. My name is Katerina. I come from Minsk. And actually, you asked the question about how long we stayed in Vilnius. So I had two periods, uh, two and a half years now. And before that, I had five years back in Minsk. And before that, I lived for eight years in Vilnius. Mm -hmm. And actually, I left Vilnius just before you started the renovation of the uh, <laughs> Neris River. So this is the mic, right? Mm -hmm. Or what? Okay. I cannot gesticulate now. I'm uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much actually for doing mm -hmm. that because I was amazed when I mm -hmm. came back that the river has changed that much. Although I really like that there were more people uh, the uh, Nariz uh, mm -hmm. river bank before, like with this fluxus place, yeah, yeah. so cultural fluxus, yeah, 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 it was yeah. named. 
So it was already uh, owned by people, but now it is definitely mm -hmm. owned by people even more. So several questions that I have about the, uh, the projects that you presented, uh, I can ask many more, but maybe I will concentrate on these three. Uh, first of all, um, just to um, uh, separate perhaps, uh, you said that you created the whole project from the very beginning, like with the analysis and uh, all this participatory approach and everything, through the implementation of the Riverbank uh, project. Uh, you were selected by the city before I everything was started, or uh, it was a joint project, so there were no competitors of yours, uh, so you were the only one. No, no, it was it was actually a little bit compl complicated, just because with the with the first political term, the the, the previous mayor, he, he had this kind of uh, three pillars, let's say, in his mm -hmm. policy. One was uh, kindergartens, then the Neris River, and bicycle paths. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then what what uh, what he did, he he had the three, let's say, thematic project leaders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, what we did together with Anton Nikit, and he did an amazing job with bicycle paths. I mean, there's there's a difference, let's say. And then uh, now, c currently, Vilnius is doing like 50 to 80 kilometers of new, like Dutch style bicycle paths. And then you see that uh, the now we kind of uh, once we design two and a half meters bicycle paths, now we see like traffic jams, let's say in the mornings, and we said, God damn it, I I thought that we have to do like uh, three and a half meters. So Anton, Anton, who was a chief engineer, now he's a chief sustainability officer in the municipality. He was a, let's say, a thematic project leader for, uh, for bicycle paths. I was a thematic uh, project leader, like thematic leader for the river. But, uh, and it was like this public participation process, the uh, overall process design, also communicating with various parties, with the investment department, with the... Uh, Vilnius Planas, who's a design department, also kind of uh, having uh, a lot of meetings involving them and then uh, trying to kind of push some things that uh, I thought are necessary. I didn't draw uh, the things myself, however, I, we had like various design reviews, most of the initiatives one way or another uh, are kind of either my idea or created by some uh, people who, who uh, are in the municipality. Also, some local entrepreneurs that wanted to do something with the river was, um, uh, or who saw the opportunity, let's say, to open a cafe or a bar. And then, uh, basically, I would have like six or seven uh, meetings a week just for the new initiative that would, could come to the, to the thing. Mm -hmm. And then there was a lot of themes. So, first, like you, you, you could imagine that one part of that is just design, yeah? just implementing it. Then there's also like fixing it, uh, just the fixing part, because fixing the, the, the embankment took around like two years and it was like several phases and then you still have to kind of coordinate it and then go and then kind of almost look at the construction site. Then there are uh, like businesses and then you also need to organize this public procurement mm -hmm. so that they can actually go there. In order to have a public procurement, you have to kind of deal with land agency and in order to secure this plot that could be rented out in a, in a public manner. So uh, if there's some kind of presentation, some kind of media, uh, let's say attention or like a, a communication opportunity, uh, like with a local press or some, or you'd kind of invite or you just uh, tell, okay, so what's, what's happening next or you present. So I, my, my, my job was more like a them thematic. So everything, let's say, even even how do you attach a boat next to a pier? Because we didn't have this, um, I'm not sure how it's called, like knechte, knecht, I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, that, that was, let's say, the, 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 my job at that mm -hmm. time. And then I was working for this uh, Vilnius development, development company, then I had a kid, and I left, but then mm -hmm. I came back as a company on a private basis, so we also did a lot of, um, let's say, assignments for public procurement, or another, like a lot of consultations for, like, evaluate design work, uh, also uh, uh, give feedback, uh, also, like, present sometimes, the, or visualize uh, uh, what is going to happen. If, let's say, a project with the stall, uh, then, yeah, I would come back real short, kind of fix it and then go back. So that was, uh, that was, that was uh, like um, uh, uh, doing a lot of things that were not technically in my job description. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's 
Thank you very much. And you have answered the second question already, mm -hmm. <laughs> because the question was about the involvement of possible businesses that might be interested to come into the yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. So no, but it's, it's like the, the idea is just uh, like this, the strategy, shake the tree and see what mm -hmm. falls out. Sometimes it's a cat, sometimes it's something like a, mm -hmm. like a pear, sometimes it's an apple, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then and it actually helps, like if you communicate, if you meet a lot of people, then, then, uh, then uh, you can build quite an extensive network or a database of possible, uh, uh, possible uh, like institutions that could be the end users. And then, uh, yeah, I somehow feel that uh, like there are a lot of good ideas that are kind of hiding in people's head, and then the only thing you need is just need to somehow kind of take it. To listen. To them. Yeah, to just listen, mm -hmm. like uh, provoke them, give them some tools, give them some fake money. I mean, it really helps. Like, uh, and then just uh, it's like it, it works like a, some kind of enabler or or, or or like head opener. What you can kind of spend on crazy things, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Head cracker. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the third question that I had uh, is uh, the influence of politicians. I understand that, for example, the River Bank project uh, lasts for over than one political term. Are there risks for such longer projects? Definitely. Uh, Definitely. The, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, imagine that uh, implementation of a project on average lasts minimum six years. Political term? Lithuania is four or five max like for president four is like uh, for, for a politician uh, what happens is that uh, it's not impossible it's not possible for a politician to implement a project that he figured out himself so uh, what happens is that um, in order to do something like meaningful for the city, you really need to think in terms of two in, in terms of two terms. So I guess one part, one first term is really to to maybe build this political capital. The second term is to spend it. You know. So sometimes you have to do something that like people want, so that you kind of elect it maybe to a, a second term, which is what wise politicians uh, would do. And then the second term is actually to kind of use the the, the benefits. And then uh, let's let's uh, let's kind of go back ten years. And then Vilnius was a half a billion uh, euros in debt. Nobody wanted to borrow him. And then we had uh, like uh, after the first term already kind of stable situation after six years. Vilnius in, in this kind of uh, for investment attraction uh, service uh, services like this kind of just vibe in general you know and then the, the, the became quite an attractive place to live and then and then uh, I kind of love it more and more and then I am really happy that I kind of made a decision to come back from 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 benevolence and then just to kind of continue my life here so that was my best decision and yours as well. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I should eat a lot. <laughs> yeah. And also, I have a bit ridiculous question. That's uh, the, the, those are usually the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, when you was talking about Naoyamas' streets, uh, you said that 30 persons goes to people, 30, like, to all goes to people, but, like, 30 persons for cars, 30 persons for nature, and where is the other 10 persons, I wonder? Um, for something, I, I don't know, like for something special, like you, do, you did the math, I see. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it means that you are not in the second grade. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, uh, let's say 10% is usually, we, we, we could choose. Usually uh, we have this kind of term and then this is three design manual where we have, um, uh, it's called Chiminiko Metras or the owner's mirror. Yeah, along the facade. And then we say that every street looks much nicer once uh, people who live next to, next to it use it. And then usually some around one meter from left, one meter from right. That's a place where, for instance, you could put a bench. That's a place like this one meter from your facade where you could uh, put a flower. That's maybe where you park your, your maybe you, where your kids, let's say, throw uh, some uh, uh, toys. That's maybe that's that's actually this kind of ten percent that the building owner should uh, uh, feel uh, obliged to use, 
Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, of course, it depends. I mean, this this is like a, a conceptual oversimplification. You know, I would I could say like thirty three point thirty three 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 three. But in general, yeah, we we basically say that like this kind of one meter from a facade is usually for this for the building owner who lives next to the street. And then uh, if um, well, let's say there's a cafe cafe and then they put in some kind of a sign. Maybe they uh, like uh, if they uh, like uh, selling something or there's like Halloween, they put pumpkins. If there's like this uh, All Saints, then they just like candles, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, and then uh, we kind of travel around Europe and then we we admire the streets where uh, where uh, shops stick out, let's say, their produce uh, or products and then uh, kind of um, uh, make the street as their extension of their store. And uh, uh, I don't know for what reason we were not doing it here. I mean, the weather, but that, that's an excuse. I mean, there's like, uh, and then once you go to like Pelia Street or this kind of classical, almost like medieval or, 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 or old style, uh, style streets, then you see that, yeah, it works perfectly. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really nice to have, to have that. And it creates this uh, atmosphere of, uh, let's say, openness. It's uh, cozy inviting and then I think this is how our city is well supposed to that's that's the message that our city has to kind of uh, communicate through uh, the street design okay yeah. thank you cheers thanks for your uh, speech for your presentation it was the money was very attractive <laughs> <laughs> and my personal <laughs> double thanks for this river sport uh, project because when I live at the beginning of the Calvaria Gatwe, I enjoy, really enjoy this envir yeah. environment and this equipment and these people who do this uh, sports stuff there, mm -hmm. it's very inspiring and calm and safety. And uh, now I live in uh, Nyamistis and uh, enjoy the uh, Algir de Gatwe. <laughs> and uh, Two years, or probably mm -hmm. a little bit more. Yes, ago we find ourselves in this reconstruction environment, mm -hmm. but it was the perfect fuck for war. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy this uh, future of of this reconstruction and mm -hmm. this future scene. Thought that it will be good, and it mm -hmm. it is now. It is possible to think about future and yeah. this goodness in the future. Yeah. Well, and I have a question: What is your future project? And I uh, the hope I will project. enjoy this. Yes. Uh, we, we, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, we usually, um, uh, uh, our clients are like municipalities, uh, like non-governmental organizations, so some non-profits that like need an advice or something like that. And then there are for-profit developers. Yeah. Uh, and then working in the field where, well, your job is kind of to try to um, uh, steer, let's say, the money in, in the kind of the right direction, so that it, so that it not only um, translates into square meters sold, but is also in some kind of public good. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is this is this is basically what we do. And then, like, there are quite a lot of projects projects that where we have kind of serious NDAs, like non-disclosure agreements. So, like, I could not talk about it. But then the Nerissa River continues. However. This time, I also part of a design team of the other side, let's say. Uh, so I kind of like did the more managing part on the right bank of Neris River. The left one, I could like do some things or design uh, things together already with my team and let's say other partners. Uh, we'll help, help out uh, a lot of municipalities all over Lithuania with strategic planning and like mobility. So like uh, talking about bicycle paths, about how to kind of create a better connections uh, for more people. The Soviet built micro rayons is uh, like, or housing in general is, is one of the things in of our expertise. Tomorrow I'm going to Warsaw. There's this, uh, it's a, there's a workshop about uh, like uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's called uh, Build Back Better. Then we also do this Yura Herit, which is about reconstruction of um, uh, Ukraine which is uh, more focused on uh, cultural heritage. Uh, then we do also, I also do teach. I have um, like an associate professor in, in uh, Kaunas University of Technology, a lecturer in Vilnius University for geographers. 
So, uh, like, um, uh, I'm kind of try to uh, keep myself quite um, uh, busy, and then not only do this like for profit urban planning things, but then yeah, some lectures, some just uh, fun events uh, that uh, are not paid. Uh, then uh, do some like research investigations, uh, and then to like improve the overall planning culture uh, in the country. Uh, also give a lot of let's say free advice that uh, uh, also helps like the people to build better like environment or just to plan it a little bit more efficiently. Uh, and also for me to to well to sell the service that I do like that that's one way or another. And then. Like a city development as such is usually perceived as something very negative because every time a construction starts, it's usually, ah, oh, I mean, there, you're like one of the few that, that said that, yeah, that's, uh, it's going to be good. I'm, I'm not so sure <laughs> in most cases. But uh, um, uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So like if, if you build something, it means that you lose something. So, and then most of the, uh, most of the people are, uh, find it... Um, are either very pro uh, status quo or either like very much pro change, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the middle or or the balance is is is, is sometimes missing, yeah. So uh, some some people just want to kind of take it and then like uh, dig out with roots, and then some people want to kind of cherish it, even though even though mm -hmm. some like people don't realize what is valuable in this like partic particular artifact and so on. So uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying, my uh, I hope my like uh, next projects uh, are going to be more interesting, maybe not necessarily bigger, but uh, uh, maybe difficult, because like I like to learn, and then uh, uh, like I learned a lot, let's say from the last ten years in the kind of uh, of the experience. I want to kind of maybe learn something new. Always trying new fields, also with data analytics, with with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, geography, with uh, programming, with uh, business management, whatever. Just uh, like pretty much anything that uh, pops in my head. Yeah. Ah, and we also have this uh, kind of nonsense generator in Lithuanian, like uh, in our website, that you just click and it generates urban planning nonsense. So like you should definitely try it out. Yeah. It's just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could, but maybe one after after this uh, is, is finished. Tell me. So. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. I have a question about: uh, Are there any global trends in terms of urban design and um, uh, from twenty twenty four onwards? Mm -hmm. And. Um, are implication of the COVID. So we know that COVID yeah. implied um, like people's lifestyle, businesses repurposes, repurposed their like activities yeah. and even fashion was impacted. And how, so what we can see in the like urban design and something maybe like do's and don'ts, like never do this. Yeah, uh, like I think that, hmm. Okay, so the, the trends, maybe. Let, let's start with from the beginning, you know? So, yeah, the COVID, that was a big impact. Some kind of a, uh, the war, massive, like, uh, things. Like, completely new topics. Like, uh, I would not imagine that uh, in, in, uh, in uh, like, in 10 years you would have, like, uh, uh, the time is, like, so dense with, with, with things that are happening in the world. Um, Kids, my my kids, like <laughs> less than ten years old, so that that that's a challenge. Uh, then, um, then uh, uh, in terms of uh, urban planning or design, I think uh, ten years ago we were talking about sustainability or climate change without really realizing what it means. Uh, however, now I think that. Uh, most of urban planners are already a little bit tired of this BS, let's say. And then we just start to simplify things. So if I would have to propose, let's say, six things that you need to do in city. One, uh, you need to build compact. You need to save land because uh, every piece of new infrastructure will cre create hard surface pressure on the environment. Not going to be good. You need to reserve space for nature. 
So everything that you like do or design needs to have at, at least a little bit of nature, at least a, a little bit uh, or a space for that nature. Then uh, you need to isolate well, you need to save energy. Yeah? Uh, you need to design neighborhoods with social infrastructure. Uh, you cannot design a neighborhood without social infrastructure because people will not be happy. You will force them to use a car and then they will have to get services from the other neighborhood. People that live in the other neighborhood will not be happy. You will be all stuck in traffic jams and so on. So like, um, then it brings me to the uh, smart mobility. And then smart, not in terms that it definitely needs an app. Yeah, But then uh, why don't we seduce people uh, to leave a car at home. Just because the services that they need are readily accessible, that maybe because of COVID, uh, two days a week you could work remotely and then your uh, boss will not be uh, about it, you know? So that you can still be productive, that you can have, a, let's say, a much more balanced, uh, let's say, lifestyle. Uh, and uh, you need to deal with water. You need to like uh, uh, save water like there are some regions that are deprived of water, which is like, like Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. We're lucky because we have one of the biggest, let's say, reserves uh, of this, um, uh, like Belarus, uh, Lithuania, Ukraine, all of these kind of regions are very um, uh, water rich, you know, and then you just basically kind of put a hole in the ground, bam, there's water. And then uh, you put there, bam. So like this kind of, uh, you know, with this uh, needles, it's, it's, it's a scam. <laughs> so you basically, if you dig uh, uh, deep enough, you always find water in this, in this side of Mississippi. Uh, so, uh, so, but you need to create a little bit less hard surfaces because uh, uh, underground infrastructure is super expensive. And then uh, let's say, imagine, imagine that you kind of take millions of euros, you know, and you bury on the ground, like euro by euro, yeah? That would be kind of stupid, you know? Uh, so why don't you, like, don't have that much hard surface and then just let the water, uh, uh, let the water uh, get into the ground like it did for millions of years? Why would you need some kind of this extra uh, rainwater infrastructure uh, once you can kind of have a lot more permeable surfaces and then save on this super, super expensive infrastructure. And then once you don't bury, let's say, your money uh, into the ground, maybe you could spend it for some kind of cooler things that you can actually see. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, build a better school, maybe uh, reconstruct a street, maybe uh, think about housing, let's say, for, for some who, who are in need. Uh, maybe try to fix microions, like renovate them and so on. So there's like a million ways of how to spend the money better. And then I think that um, uh, one way or another, like the, the point that I was trying to go with the previous uh, thing, but then I kind of was like diverted by myself, is that um, even though like the urban development process somehow feels as something quite negative for most of the people, but I don't know a single uh, city that was built without money. So money is, is, is one way or another is very important. And then uh, spending it wisely on the things that uh, actually matter, not spending it in a, on, on stupid things, on like uh, Olympic stadiums or whatever, uh, or, or, or some kind of uh, uh, nonsensical events, then, then I, think, uh, I think that that's kind of the main advice. And I think most of the cities, one way or another, are now kind of are in a race of um, climate neutrality. However, I think that it's a current trend, but the trend afterwards, someone will have to say that, no, 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 but uh, I mean, building a sustainable city in a desert in Qatar, maybe that's not really the most sustainable thing to do, you know? So uh, I think the next trend will be called like, n now let's do it for real <laughs> or something like that. I don't know. And uh, uh, in terms of how people, uh, how people uh, move, yeah, they're much like um, every society which uh, develops, they're much more mobile. Now everyone sees themselves as some kind of a citizen of a world. Uh, you can work remotely. Uh, you could, um, uh, uh, like there's Lithuanian school in Mallorca. So 
like that for half a year kids go to school there just because their parents don't really like this whatever so and then i mean who could ever imagined that would ever happen that is just like like during the winter times of, of uh, school month so um, or not maybe Mallorca, maybe um, I don't know, some other island. It's far away. But but there are the people who's like spending three or four months. This is kind of entire nasty uh, period in Lithuania, and they they have all the infrastructure, and then kind of buying apartments and then living there, and then coming back for the summer, which is like the greatest uh, months here. Yeah. So. I have another question. Thank you very much. Quick one. Mm -hmm. Or if oh, I'm I'm very I'm very <laughs> like. Uh, uh, I'm very well known for quick answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's my strength. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, yeah, so if I'm uh, just a random person yeah. from the street yeah. and uh, I have a bright idea to like uh, bring somewhere, yeah. is there a, do I have any chances uh, to introduce idea? In a city? Be, uh, yes. It, uh, is there any chance it can be implemented somehow? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th uh, like, um, uh, uh, okay, so first, like, uh, at least most of the um, uh, participation processes that are related to built environment, they are, uh, they are kind of regulated by law. Yeah? Uh, most of the projects have public presentations. So it means that um, uh, you can contribute to the projects that are already happening. Then uh, there are like these kind of focus groups that are much, that are related to to let's say strategic planning. And then there's, if you check uh, let's say Vilnius municipality, you could always if you're active, there is always some kind of planning document or strategic planning document is happening. So uh, you, as a, some kind of expat community, if you organize yourself well and then you make yourself heard, I think uh, uh, one, one thing that I really like about Lithuania is that uh, uh, you can call a minister yeah, or you can call a mayor and then he might answer uh, if it's like uh, urgent. And then there's, there's not this kind of in-between gap, uh, let's say, in democracy. And that, that's, that's really funny sometimes because... Uh, like uh, you walk into a cafe and there's like Minister of Environment also buying a coffee from his obviously not paper cup, <laughs> you know. So, uh, or maybe there's uh, like a Minister of Education and so on. So, uh, so I, I really like uh, Vilnius because of that, because you kind of bump into uh, people and then, and then you can also like pitch an idea, you know. And then there are, I think, multiple platforms uh, where you could do that. Most, almost all of the ministries have the social partners lists and then for instance uh, I don't know I'm I know Ministry of Environment quite well so for instance like one Friday a month they have the social partner uh, like a gathering where they kind of communicate like new ideas or something that uh, that don't work uh, and so on uh, most of the people like if you write them uh, and it's like not in a formal way then they would definitely respond if they have time obviously but um, uh, but usually they do, and uh, so there's also this international house, uh, Vilnius, which also kind of uh, answers a lot of questions, which is like an innovation from, from like maybe a few years ago that also supposed to help about various questions. So I think there's quite a lot of, let's say, platforms where you, where you could uh, realize yourself. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering. Perfect answer. I have one. Very quick. Yeah, yeah. I have also a very short answer, <laughs> definitely. What is the most innovative thing you've ever saw? Saw? Ever? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, uh, all, uh, all around urban design, of course. Uh, I'm usually... Um, I'm be oh, it's going to be a very short answer. Okay, so... I'm, I'm somehow uh, quite, usually quite fascinated with the thing that you kind of, uh, let's say, see for the fir very first time. So like 10 years ago with the first, let's say, wooden skyscraper or at least like high rise building. Uh, once you kind of talk with people who realized it, that, that at that time, like 10 years ago, that, that was very impressive. 
then like nine years ago then you then uh, there are some guys who had a, like heavily contaminated land which was formerly harbor and they dumped so many chemicals in that part uh, and then the uh, municipality of Amsterdam said, okay, let's do some kind of a regeneration project and then let's uh, find some ideas. And then since land was so contaminated, you cannot build anything on it. So what they did, they took old barges, they put those barges on that land, they created some kind of a path, and then they grew like for six or seven years vegetation that cleans this oil and so on. And then they kind of dig it in and then the soil is clean, they move the barges. So this, this, it's kind of an ephemeral project, you know, you cannot, you cannot say that, yeah, I build a pyramid of Egypt and it's going to last for 2,000 years. And then you kind of intentionally build something for like five or six years, it, it, it does the job and then you demolish it. So it, it was also partially the, the intent of this lecture, like of how to learn to kind of like embrace your ideas and then just let it go. So I think... Uh, uh, that's the most innovative thing in uh, realizing that everything is uh, ephemeral or, or like lasting for a very short time even us like in terms of uh, urban development uh, of centuries that uh, we could leave maybe some kind of a small mark maybe leave some kind of a uh, very small input uh, or in, in this universe and that's fine yeah that's good enough so let's let's don't be too uh, harsh on ourselves if something doesn't happen. Yeah, and if it happens, then it's bravo. Yeah. So, what can we do with this uh, depressed uh, buildings of Soviet Union times? It's very hard to, uh, I think, uh, move it somewhere because there's too much people living there. Oh man, you're not. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we we last year we did a study, which is like. 360 pages of like conclusions almost so uh, um, we will have to live with, with it yeah for the next 50 years um, uh, it doesn't matter that it looks ugly or gloomy or whatever uh, people who live there they let's say call it the home so uh, we have to like innovate like crazy in that field because we we are late uh, and then uh, we just just like uh, as a number you know so uh, in total in Lithuania there's um, 37,000 apartment buildings of like five nine story and 16 story and so on 37,000 of these buildings uh, the best scenario the best the best statistics year was around 600 a year in the country if we do it like this, yeah, it will take us another hundred years to renovate the last the house. And then the question is, do you think that the houses that we just renovated will not need the renovation? Yeah, I mean it's 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 a very difficult task, uh, but uh, we need to uh, we need to learn some lessons. We realize that modernist uh, modernist made, made uh, quite a lot of mistakes. Uh, that uh, city people want to live in the cities where public and private space are very clearly defined. Uh, people somehow tend to um, not like this kind of technocratic landscape. So you need, so you need uh, a lot more diversity in, in terms of uh, not only social diversity, because it's already quite diverse, but also in terms of typological diversity. Those environments have to become uh, good enough for living, working and free time. So that uh, this kind of Soviet microrayon is not a sleeping district, district, but it's actually a living district. And uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, uh, this is this is like all of the all of the uh, post-Soviet countries are actually have a massive headache about what to do with it. And then uh, you cannot just like uh, it's 50% of our housing stock. Like 50% of people actually live in the houses like this. So it's incredibly difficult. And then the question is. 
like if government will pay for the renovation of uh, your apartment, why doesn't government pay for a renovation of a villa of a millionaire? Yeah. So, so like, is it fair? Yeah, and uh, as yeah. you said, like, don't do much because it uh, might be too much. With yeah, some then, small metamorphosis, it can be just more, um, more joyful yeah. place, more interesting exactly. place. Exactly, and, uh, and then let's, let's uh, like, uh, I also wrote my thesis on that uh, in, in the Netherlands, and, uh, and then uh, once you kind of look at the, the ideals, I really like this, uh, this guy, the, the Dutch professor called uh, Wouter van Stibhout, and then once he was talking about this modernist uh, housing, he said that he like the, that's one of the, my favorite uh, quotes is that uh, uh, planning is like a knife. You know, you could cut bread with it and feed people, or you could kill them. So, like this is this is how it goes. So, like once you once you go with these ideals and then with this with this uh, uh, with these concepts too far and or at a, a time too innovative then it can backfire. And I also did quite a lot of interviews with the planners who actually did those neighborhoods in Lithuania. Yeah, and some of them are also kind of uh, saying that, yeah, I mean, there's, there were a lot of problems with construction. There was a lot of problem with uh, theft from construction site. There was a lot of problem with the uh, functions that are not implemented because only like usually, and then uh, that was a problem with uh, this kind of previous, let's say, uh, state <laughs> that we had in between our independences uh yeah so uh, that's just the regime that doesn't work i mean uh, i like like yeah so um so yeah uh, that's a super and um, actually mm -hmm. the the things you designed or you designing currently should be like valuable in both in winter and summer yeah, so how it impacts your you know like way of thinking um, and way of let's thinking. say in terms in terms of design uh, uh, there's this g group of uh, french architects they're called lacaton and vassal and i uh, and i kind of i really like the way they uh, design things and then what they what they say that usually in winter nature saves resources yeah everyone saves resources like the bears are asleep hibernating so the trees like they they don't waste their energy on on maintaining leaves like they fall uh, then the root systems uh, shrink like if you cut the roots uh, of a tree let's say once the nature is calm well nothing really happened that severe but if you do it like in a in a vegetation uh, period like in spring then then it would be kind of or late spring then then you can kill a tree uh, but then once this nature is calm so it is also to good. It's also good to live like with this like kind of natural cycle. So, for instance, in architecture, how you could translate that? You could translate that you have this uh, core where you live during winter, so you compact. You maybe live in one room with your family. You save energy, but in summer you kind of expand, and then maybe the wall, the wall, uh, your plot becomes your uh, living room. And then uh, uh, in terms of architecture, maybe like having some kind of uh, this uh, verandas or some like uh, double, double purpose uh, rooms that uh, could function in these kind of intermediate periods. I think that's quite a sustainable thing to do because heating the entire like 250 square meter house, once you still like, like uh, want to be kind of cozy in, 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 in your bedroom and you want to save energy, it's, it's not really... Uh, it's not really smart. So in terms of architecture, your house should be able, or the, the functionality of your house should be able to contract during winter and then expand during summer once it's like full of resources, full of energy, and then there's a lot of life happening outside, just the way we do. Once we're talking about public spaces or programming public spaces, then of course there's some infrastructure that cannot be uh, used um, uh, during summer. However, for instance, if you uh, if you have uh, some kind of like trees or or, or uh, uh, bushes, uh, you could put snow there, and then it's actually good for 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 bushes because it saves them uh, from freezing. So you could also like use this like just for snow storage, just because moving out snow uh, from a city is a, is a massive. Uh, a massive challenge. 
then uh, once you have some kind of even like public playgrounds, you could also like minimize the amount of space that you need to take care of during winter. And maybe you won't have this kind of slippery sidewalks. So I think it's like, it's just really about the efficient organization of resources in the city planning. And um, uh, like uh, understanding the city quite well, measuring it, like uh, figuring out okay, so why, where people move. And then first, first uh, solving the, the, the lines that have the most impact. I think that's, that's the way to go. And only then focusing on um, infrastructure that you used by the least people. And then uh, in most cases, uh, the use of city resources is absolutely unfair. Because the densest environments are the Soviet built neighborhoods. However, they are maintained the poorest, usually. And then the outskirts, some kind of suburbs, there's like 10 people in a hectare versus like a thousand people in a hectare in a micro rayon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, that one could be clean. That could have a perfect uh, like uh, trash uh, collection. Uh, that could have like a uh, perfect asphalt and so on. So it's not fair. It's not fair allocation of resources. And I think that, that the major what I'm always saying, the sustainability is not always about the like this kind of energy and en uh, energy or technical things. It's also about fair allocation of money. And that that's that's uh, like. Um, uh, people really hate to talk about money, and then I, I think we need to talk about money. I think that is kind of an elephant in the room, and then uh, like uh, everyone is talking about like birds and bees and then uh, whatever, and about some kind of uh, topics that are uh, uh, more of a noise and not really contributing to the to the narrative. But if we if we are actually fair about how we spend the our hard earned taxes, then I think then we could. Uh, we could achieve much more as a, as, a, as a society, as a country, as a city, as a, as a, as a, as a community. Yeah. Thanks. So. Uh, it's a little bit uh, funny. I have a two questions, but you can choose in which uh, answer. Oh, I will definitely answer <laughs> both. Uh. Uh, you, 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 we will see, we will see. Well, you uh, tell, told uh, that uh, you will attend in uh, this uh, meeting about uh, rebuilding Ukraine. Yeah. Have you already have an idea for them, for this uh, situation? And the second question, mm -hmm. uh, metro, subway in Vilnius, is it necessary? Is it important? Is it, po is it possible? Not yet, but uh, there's um, good news and bad news, you know? So. Uh, Bad news that no metro is not feasible yet in Vilnius. There's just not enough, not enough inhabitants, uh, and then uh, we also do not live in a planned economy. And then it would be kind of the most like super expensive project. And then uh, uh, I know that there are like some uh, people who say that yeah, it's not expensive. But then once you start digging in the ground like giant pipe, then it's just like like billions. But the fact that we only have buses and trolley buses. That's a bit problematic because uh, a city our size, most of the cities our size have at least a tram or some kind of a light rail. And then uh, we should have pl started planning uh, trams 10 years ago. Uh, and then we're late. And then we see that are in certain bus stops, we have these free axle buses that are stopping uh, every 30 seconds. So it means that we, we reached uh, the maximum capacity. There's no, there's no way we can grow. And uh, it means that uh, once we reach this maximum capacity, then like the public transport is not attractive because there's, it's too crowded. Then people who uh, can afford, let's say, driving to the city, they will definitely drive a, a car and will not take a public transport. And uh, Vilna City is actually quite good. We could have a perfect kind of a X uh, of a tram network with some uh, 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 transfer hubs, not very difficult to, to make those. We just ne need a, like a political decision and do it. And then we, we needed that 10 years ago. So, but then we could not afford it. So now we could kind of afford it, but then we are not making the decision yet. So uh, tram no, uh, tram yes, yes, yes. Uh, metro, no, no, no. 
uh, alternative alternative mobility like scooters, bicycle paths, and so on. It's already happening. We 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 cannot stop because because um, uh, yeah we're late with some things and therefore we need to compensate in other fields and uh, yeah. So that's that's the situation we're in. Yeah. Ukraine. And then uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Choose. Yeah, Ukraine. Um, uh, it's a very difficult. It's a very difficult project. But also, uh, I've been in Lviv for like uh, three uh, three months ago, and then uh, yeah, I see that there's enormous amount of let's say potential and passion of of to do something differently. And then I think that, by the way they think, they're already. Uh, 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 they're like this, in this kind of Lithuanian mode to that where Lithuania was like 20 years ago. Like once we got into European Union, it's kind of <laughs> kind of really like energized, really like pushing, really uh, discussing, uh, like uh, really fighting almost with each other for for like a better society. Uh, and it's very impressive. I mean, uh, and then uh, because here now we're already uh, kind of used of all the, let's say, benefits of uh, like EU, traveling, like uh, being, let's say, global citizens. And then you see that uh, they are very much eager of, of uh, kind of uh, like transforming their society like in the next 10 years. And I really, I really think that um, uh, the worst thing I could do is, um, uh, is to have an idea for them because then it makes me some kind of a, I don't know, like a colonial, whatever, like patronizing asshole. I don't know. So I don't want to do that. But then if they have, if, if they have uh, let's say, a question or need help uh, or need an advice, I would, I would definitely like uh, help them out. And then I think that's, that, that is my function in, in this current project. And then as an educator, uh, uh, I also want to kind of support, uh, especially the younger generation, because they will have to deal with that all the mess, uh, with the design the problems and so on. So, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I think they're going to be all right. I mean, at least the the, the people that I met, they're definitely going to be all right. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for excellent questions. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wonderful audience. Thank you very much.